Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast. Today is indeed a great day because I'm speaking to uh, the drummer extraordinaire, Rufus Tiger Taylor. You may be aware of Rufus, of course, for many reasons. He is the drummer of the darkness, and he has been for the last 10 years. Um, he's the son of Roger Taylor, the drummer out of Queen, that is. Um, and you may have seen him perform at the Taylor Hawkins tribute show for the Foo Fighters. Um, he's one of the greatest drummers around right now, and that is not just my opinion that uh, has been supported by the fact that he's been voted the third best drummer in the world by Music Radar last year. Um, this was a, a challenging chat for me um, because Rufus and I know each other so well. We finish each other's sandwiches and um, he's just an, he's just a great, a great guy. And I think I was, because I'm, I spent so much time with Rufus, I was a little bit reluctant as an interviewer to sort of guide him into these difficult areas, talking about his dad and talking about Taylor Hawkins and stuff like that. But we did get there in the end. Um, I think my favourite part of this uh, was towards the end, there's a, the, uh, a quick fire round with some very, very obscure questions and he handled himself really impeccably throughout that uh, grilling um, and he's just a brilliant guy, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, you can also listen to this as a podcast over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, and all those places. Um, also, The Darkness are on tour in the UK, Europe, and USA this year, so if you fancy seeing both myself and Rufus perform on the same stage at the same time, singing the same songs, ideally, um, check out the link in the description, and we'll have a list of all the dates and tickets there. Um, for now, though, please, to enjoy. Okay. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Today I'm joined by drummer extraordinaire Rufus Tiger Taylor, who um, is the Darkness's current drummer um, and has been our drummer for how many years would you say that was? It's got to be coming up to 10. Must be nearly 10 <laughs> years. The longest serving golden era mega drummer of the Darkness with blonde hair, Rufus Tiger Taylor. <laughs> Justin Hawkins rides again. <laughs> Blonde hair. Again. There it is. Right. How you doing, Ru? You alright? <coughs> I'm good. Cool. How are you? Yeah, I'm alright. Just got a bit of a, you know, dodgy shoulder apart from that. It's all right. Yeah. Don't want anyone to worry too much, but, uh, you know, no. can't, can't move my arms or anything, but it's alright, you know, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get through it. Um... And uh, so we're preparing for, I suppose most of the most of this will be talking about twentieth anniversary of Permission to Land. Um, two o. Are you are you excited about PTL two zero? I mean, personally, I'm so glad you asked because <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so excited. Yeah, really excited. I want to I want to get into playing all those songs as well. Did you um, have you listened to all the additional tracks and B sides from the first record? Because uh, I've heard them, I haven't been <laughs> practicing them though. No, you, no need. I mean, you should put your own spin on those things, anyways. You know, <coughs> they're quite. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put me on spin on it. Yeah. Thing about that first album is that you know nowadays we record the bare minimum amount of tracks necessary. And we just about scrape it, and then the worst one goes on the. No offense to our Japanese listenership, but uh, the worst one ends up being the bonus track on a Japanese edition only. Mm. Well, the, 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 no, not the worst one. How can I, the, the least, the most interesting one. Usually yeah, goes but the on standards there. are high. I mean, well, you know. yeah, we're talking about elite stuff, really. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, it's all world class material, but um, back in those days, we did like 20 songs I think and then we thought all of them might end up on the record and then we were sort of selecting stuff accordingly um, <clears throat> so I think the the additional set that we do which is going to have all the interesting stuff in it will be probably my favourite bit <laughs> so let me it's ask you be fun. let me ask you this what's your favourite uh, Darkness B-side oh You're not allowed to Google darkness B sides to, to, make, I'm sure not. You, to make sure you no, say what. Look one. at my hands. <laughs> <laughs> You're using Siri with um, a voice prompt. Oh, I don't know. I love you five times. Is I really love that one. Do you think we should do it traditional, like on the record, or should should we do it with me on a keyboard? Oh, that was and my you wrist. filming it? Did you hear that? Um, no, I, I, we did it before. <laughs> yeah, but I, I did it on a like with an accompaniment from a keyboard, didn't I? Oh no, uh, that, yeah. was, uh, that was that um, was. Open fire. Sorry, that's my bad. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah. If you've still got the footage of that, you could send that to um, to Jenny. I do. I'll send it on to Jenny. Yeah. Okay, cool. Give me a hug on a sheepskin rug. Tell me about who never parted. Open fire. But I don't think I know anybody else who, whose dad is like, does the same job as them. Yeah. It, I, I don't know what I'm saying here. I suppose I wanted to ask you about your dad, because a, a lot of people do, don't they? They always sort of go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What did they say to you? Like, they say some stuff I, which I just think is rude, you know. Um... Will you say hello to your dad for me? You get that a lot, don't you? Or, yeah. Or I met your dad once upon a time, and you're and you're like, yeah, I've known him all my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually. But I think yeah. that's like I suppose the question I wanted to ask was: Is does your father cast a shadow over your career? Because I feel like it must be difficult to try and be your own man when your dad has I mean, achieved yeah, all that. Of course. You know? Yeah, yeah. But I came to grips with that many moons ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. But, and I think maybe, did it help that you kind of, because you did some, you were the percussionist for Queen for quite a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, for about five years. And that was awesome. Um, but it was mainly just, uh, you know, spending the time. I mean, I, I knew that was unrealistic, you know, uh, touring. So that's why I, I enjoyed it so much. Oh, I see yeah. what you mean. Yeah, because if I might compliment you here, <clears throat> I mean, me and my brother and Frankie, and we're all just small town guys, really. You know, we're just pub band players that have somehow ended up in this position, you know. And, um, and then you come along with your pedigree and your upbringing. And to your eternal um credit or maybe to your, your parents credit actually um you're not a dick <laughs> you know? thanks man and <laughs> i mean I, 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 could be, uh, I could be more glowing than that but you know you sort of have this expectation that that somebody's going to walk in and be a dick you know I'm, i just, i knew i knew you wouldn't that wouldn't happen because pete malinjone who i've already uh interviewed was the person that suggested using you and he wouldn't do that unless uh if you were at, yeah. like that, you know, but, um, but you're not, you know, I think you're really just like a uh, super down to earth, really hardworking, really great taste in music, really, and totally different style of playing to your dad. Who, so yeah. who are your, who are your drum influences? Your dad must be one of them, surely. Well, thanks man. But, um, uh, of course he is. Yeah. Yeah. He was always the first one, you know, cause, um, I don't know, you grow up you grow up hearing it a lot, the music. Mm. Uh and then you sort of develop your own kind of understanding of it as a kid, you know, but you don't understand what's you know what I mean? You you haven't learned anything yet, so you don't know what's going on. Yeah. But um Yeah, and then uh and then obviously you see you grow up seeing him play live and everything and and that's your first introduction to drums and stuff live drums but um but yeah it was it was more as as you grow up you uh you see some other shows and and I was in a privileged position to be next to him when he was watching some of these shows you know and he knew some of these people and so uh you know I had a really cool introduction to a lot of my favorite band still to this day and and uh yeah i think that's what really kept it kept the hunger for me you know was um people like ian pace and taylor hawkins and you know all these people yeah but uh yeah 
Yeah, yeah, You're still doing it. Yeah, because I mean, I, you, you, you still, you always introduced me to really interesting music that has completely passed me by, like some super obscure stuff from the sixties and seventies. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because like when we were on our little holiday break in Mexico, you were showing me Terry Reid and some bits of the Jackie Wilson catalog that I wasn't. Oh yeah, I wasn't actually aware of. I knew, I know, I know a lot of Jackie Wilson stuff, but you were showing me some sort of barber shoppy do what yeah, things yeah and i always think um i always assume that you know your dad's perhaps your dad's influenced your taste a bit and I, and i wanted to ask you if um was there ever a time when you started listening to some music and he didn't approve of it uh <laughs> um yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to know who it was Oh God! Because I think your dad is the only person I know. Out of, I mean, he's the only person I can think of who's got stronger opinions about music than I have. You know, he's yeah. really, really hardcore with with stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he is. Um, I think it was. God, who was it when they came out? Uh... <laughs> it was either it was either Nickelback. <laughs> Or some forty one. <laughs> but at least it's still got guitars in it, though. Oh yeah, I mean, no, absolutely. Yeah, because I, I was I've been and, trying to bring uh, and, my and little girl up with with good music. You know, I showed her. Yeah. You know, she was really into Lewis Cole, and she liked rock and roll and ACDC, and she loves Queen and all that. And um, but I think peer pressure kicked in, and now she's very much into sort of um, Taylor Swift and. She's dancing to sort of Katy Perry and stuff on her own. Yeah, but that comes from school as well. I think know. it's peer pressure, isn't it? It's other yeah. kids. I would well, hope. it's just what everyone's listening to, I guess. You know? Yeah. But I was really hoping that, you know, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> 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 because it's kind of like, because the thing, you know how kids listen to music, it's kind of like they listen to it all the time, and on repeat. And yeah. As keeper of the um musical devices it's i'm obliged to hear it too oh yeah i know and i don't want to be hardcore about it how, how do i how did your father dissuade you from listening to some 41 and nickelback um <laughs> honestly uh it wasn't you know it's not deep or anything <laughs> was it a glance it, just, <laughs> was it? it was just it was definitely a glance and maybe a quick comment um What's this, this is shit? shit? Is one of them. I think it was used sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Succinct, but you know, just purely objective. I mean, yeah, of course, isn't it? Course. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then, but then it would be followed up by a quick introduction into oh. where he reckons that came from. Oh, you know what I mean? Cool. Which was cool. That and, is cool. Um, and I can't remember who it was before that, but yeah. When he did that with Led Zeppelin, it was a big deal, you mm -hmm. know? That was a big deal. Yeah. It's like when you show like, like The Godfather to someone who hasn't seen it for the first yeah. time, you're like, like you've got to understand, like, this isn't, yeah. this isn't like a, you know. Yeah, well, when, yeah, when somebody's watching a movie and saying it's the greatest movie ever made, and then you show them The Godfather. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um... What's what's your favorite what's your favorite drum? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um drum beat. I mean, drum beat. <laughs> what's your favorite drum no, beat? No, let's stick with the other one. What's, okay, what's, what's your, your favorite, favorite drum? drum? <laughs> um I like the one where it's got a stick and you do that and all the the two things hit it. You know what I mean? It's like a karate uh... drum. Oh yeah, okay. No, yeah. I don't know what that means, but the do you, I'll put karate drum then. Just put that down. Yeah, karate drum. Yeah, you don't hear it much yeah. these days, but um, beautiful. If you could have like, um, if you had infinite budget and yeah. all the time in the world, and to build a drum set, <sighs> yeah. how many toms would you have, and how small would they go? Um, would you have a symbols behind your head or just stick to the front? Do you like flashy stuff or, or is less more in some instances? I mean, I think less is more, to be honest. So but, you'd only um, ever be one, one kick drum pedal, obviously. 
I think always one for me. Yeah. I'm yeah. just stubborn that way. What does the other foot do then in those instances? Well, I mean, it it hangs about. Mm. It does the hi hat. Oh yeah, because it opens and yeah. closes that, doesn't it? It opens and closes that thing. Mm. That's two things for mm. one foot mm. to deal with. Mm. It's a lot to so, take on. Um, lot yeah, of, lot it, of responsibility. Uh, it does its job. Yeah. Huh? Lot what was of, that? Lot of responsibility. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Because I think people that, forget about the left foot. Yeah, I think you know a lot of people who watch this will will know already how drums work, really. But I think what you're talking about there is that the, there's a dynamic lift, isn't there, when you have the hi hats open, and you can use that for choruses or up sections, and it Absolutely. swishes around and just sounds more exciting. Yeah. You know, the loud bits. The loud bits. Yeah. So yeah. you're so the the foot that ostensibly doesn't seem to be doing very much, is actually responsible for the dynamics of the entire song, really. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Ostensibly speaking, yes, yeah. you're right. Ostensibly, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what, um, have you ever done any, you got any, what, are you a spiritual individual? Do you, um, do you meditate or anything like that? Or? Nah. <laughs> 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 to your coffee uh, <laughs> uh, no never been much of a spiritual person sorry yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know uh, there's certain what things, would you I do guess. if I turned up to a gig <laughs> what would you do if, <laughs> to, <God. laughs> if I turned up in a, a hand woven um, <laughs> you know um, a poncho or whatever and then started going about ayahuasca sat down in the corner of the dressing room, cross-legged and started saying, "Om." Um, what would you think? And do uh, I think, I think there might be something wrong. Ah, you'd, you'd be concerned. I wouldn't be sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I'd need to hang out with you for a bit longer. Yeah. To see. See what's actually going on. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> if you're a yogi now or something. Yeah. Okay, how comfy are you talking about Taylor Hawkins' uh, tribute shows and things like that? Do you want to get into that or avoid? Yeah, I'm fine with the tribute shows, yeah. Okay. Um, that was an amazing thing that we both did. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the the the, the really special part of the, the, the Wembley one, at least, was like um, the week that we spent... Yeah, you know, bonding with everybody and and just sort of um, the preparation week when we were rehearsing and and hanging out at that really cool hotel and eating dinner together all, all at the same time. It was it was such a because we had to immerse ourselves in that, in yeah. that, and for it to succeed really. And everybody was a, a team player, and it was and there's a lot of people, you know. Yeah, it was like yeah. over a hundred people or something all doing the same thing for the same cause so much focus wow. and i don't know it was just it was a beautiful experience wasn't it i mean and it seemed like there was a you know kind of an equal s amount of nerves yeah in the in the rehearsal spaces you know because there's so many i mean i know from a drummer's perspective there were so many drummers you know all just watching so yeah it was quite a it was quite a weird thing, but a very cool thing. Very cool thing. Yeah, and when you did your numbers, I think everybody was completely blown away. And immediately after that, the rumours started. And, yeah. And it was all, yeah. you know, it was always like, um, okay, so the next drummer of the Foo Fighters has to be Rufus. <laughs> Which, you know... Oh, people were saying to me, "Are you? How do you feel about losing Rufus to the Foo's?" And I was like, "Over my dead body." Walking. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the transfer fee and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, I think we we talked about it, didn't we? Because it was kind of yeah, like we it, did. If it was very early on, actually, yeah, I was blown away by what you said. But, um... Yeah, I said five million bucks <laughs> finder's fee. <laughs> and then we, you know. <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it... Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go on. You, you go. I'm going to smoke this one. 
Um, yeah, it was a it was a special thing, you know, to be a part of. Uh, I got called by Dave to ask to bid to do it when we were on the road somewhere in Scandinavia, I think, and um, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was huge. He, I think he only thought. Wembley at the time or something and it, or he was like it could be two shows we might do a second one or something in, in LA and I figured that would happen and but yeah it was it was very important to me to have you there it was it was it was really awesome that we got to do it together oh it I, you know I think when you because you told me about that you know that I was going to get a call from Dave at some point oh yeah and I think I was like Holy fuck! Okay, wow, awesome. <laughs> um, and it was from the you know from the moment you said that, I started getting nervous. <laughs> you know, and I really, didn't, yeah, yeah, because I think it was um, Wiley was trying to reach out about the Van Halen stuff, um, and then when I spoke to Dave, he was talking about the Queen stuff, and you know, yeah. It's yeah. that's that's terrifying. You know, it's just terrifying. Yeah, it surprise, still surprises me to hear that though, from you. <laughs> there's so much at stake, though. Yeah, I know. Because it's not just about doing those gigs; it's doing those gigs on that occasion in tribute. Well, to I that, remember to there was man, even a conversation you know? my dad was having about um, under pressure. Yeah. And I and, and I know I threw it out there. I just went, "Well, Justin's there. He's like right there." Oh, so you and got like, oh, yeah, you got me that sake, gig as well. Course. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'd like to think so. Yeah. But I don't know. Might not have been. But, if, but fuck me, you killed it. Oh, thanks. It was, ins- it was just amazing. I remember Dave saying um, uh, we, were in, we were in the rehearsals and, um, and you, 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 you did your first run through, I think, of the Van Halen stuff. And, uh, and he was like, right, that sells it. Uh, Justin's going to do all the stuff that no one else can sing or play on guitar. <laughs> Brilliant. I was like, "Come on, come on. <laughs> amazing!" No, it was, was awesome. Yeah, it was really. I mean, it was heady. That's that's what it was. It was just so yeah. many emotions and yeah, so many people. It's just mad, you know. Yeah, <sighs> and and all these heroes, you know, and they're all going up one by one. And we're just watching them, and then yeah. and then they go. Oh yeah, it's you now. And you go. Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> and you, you got to speak to um, uh, Sir Paul McCartney as well, didn't you? Yeah, that was mind blowing. I couldn't believe that. What do you say to him? Um, basically, I'll never forget this moment. So he, he, uh, they, they said after Best of You, they were like, Gus, the manager, was like, um, wait around, you know, wait around for a bit. Um, we're, we're going to do a big bow or something like that. I was like, oh, okay, okay. So I hung back somewhere. And then um, after I saw Dave and a bunch of people go up to the front, I was like, oh, okay, you know, now we can kind of go up. And so I went up and just as I got up to start walking, I felt these two hands slap on my shoulders. And I was thinking that could have been one of a few people that I know up here, you know, <laughs> that would have done that. You or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, turned around and it was fucking him (laughs) and uh yeah he just went you were fucking great like that and i couldn't believe it wow yeah absolute high praise from the ultimate legend yeah mind-blowing wow one of my absolute ultimate heroes as well yeah yeah very cool i actually missed the bow because i was weeping I was up on the side weeping oh yeah you were (laughs) weren't you i think wiley was up there with me actually i think we were just having a little weep yeah. <laughs> you know. A wily weep. Yeah, a little wily weep. Yeah. yeah, well, the day was full of those. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It really was. It was crying from the first moment, really. Yeah. You know. It was it was a very heavy moment watching all the people come in. Yeah, that's true. That was quite surreal. Yeah. I don't know, because it didn't it, it, from that moment it didn't feel like a normal, you know, show like that, you know. Yeah, that's true. You don't see that every time, do you? No. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. All quite solemn as well. Everyone was very. But yeah, no. What? 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 A, what? A, what? What a thing to be a part of. 
and uh, and an unbelievable thing for basically one guy to organize that's yeah. just, <laughs> that's ridiculous it's staggering in a few months you know yeah um yeah i thought that was very impressive all the big brothering all everyone there kind of thing it was quite that was very but uh anyway he um one really cool thing that he did that day uh another unforgettable story was um he was backstage at his little bar and we were all there i think you were right with, next to me and he was uh and he was he went up to the bar and he's uh he's smoking a cigarette and um and then he he goes give me four shots of whiskey so uh, <laughs> this this lady like lines up four shots of crown royal he does he does all all he does the first three and then he picks up the fourth and goes um fuck let's go play a load of rush songs <laughs> <laughs> he walks out there. I was like, Fuck you know. "Wow, you're definitely the only person here who can do that." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. So, what was your favorite? What was your favorite moment then, as a spectator and as a participant? Um, as a spectator, I don't know. There was so many cool things. Um, seeing Paul McCartney do his thing was awesome. Uh, seeing Stuart Copeland play drums for the first time live, that was mind-blowing. Um, I thought, I'm picking from both here. Yeah. The LA one, I thought Pink, I thought oh uh, when God. she sang... Um, Barracuda. Uh, yeah, Barracuda, that just, that was so mind-blowing to me. I thought that was such an amazing, yeah, insane as performance. A, just as a vocal... You know, yeah, before just you, a vocal, yeah, even just before a walk you, on, just a walk on and do that, I was like, fucking, you know, it was I, unbelievable. I remember when she did it in the sound check, and it was kind of like, um, it was like a, um, a bugle cry, and <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like a, everybody in the building was just like, "What the fuck?" And then had to go and yeah. see who it was and what was happening. It just yeah, sounded, it, really was. it sounded amazing. It was, it was so good. Yeah, it was incredible that. Yeah, and um. <clears throat> who else? Rush were really cool. Danny Carey, but uh, yeah. uh, Chad was amazing. Just to watch him, watch ch to watch Chad play. What did he play? Y Y Z. I can't remember. Actually. I think he did. Uh, it was, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, I love watching Chad play. Yeah, he's he great. Used to living crap out of them. Yeah. Because um, you get some drummers who um, look as though they're going to hit the thing really hard. They might have their hands all the way up yeah. here and then they bring their hand down and then when they strike it, they just go, be dink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the dinkers. Yeah. What do you call that, a tickler? <laughs> Is that a tickler? Yeah, I think we call that a tickler. Yeah. 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 And it's always but sort of there's frustrating. There's a lot of peacocking about. Yeah. A lot of peacocking you about. Can, yeah. I mean, we're not talking about anybody in particular, but I think, I think it's fair to say that you don't get away with that in a room with, no, with all those, so, yeah. those sort of hard hitting with, proper not guys. Not with Chad you know. Smith. Yeah, not when Chad Smith's up next. Well, yeah. And yourself. I mean, you know, you don't stand for any of that nonsense. Um, <laughs> I don't think your dad does either. No. I know Dave Taylor doesn't. doesn't. Dave yeah. doesn't. You know, all the John Bonham. I don't know. Yeah. Even Mitch Mitchell. Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland still hits the living crap out of them. Like, yeah, oh, with jazz so grip. impressive to watch. Yeah, traditional, yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah, just amazing. Yeah, I, I just like, I like watching them work hard. That's what yeah, I like. yeah, and you want to sort of, you want to see the drum set in some peril, like it's going to fall apart. Yeah. You don't want it to, you don't want to be reassured that it's going to last for the entire tour. You you, you no. don't want it to make <laughs> yeah. the song, really. You, yeah. you, you want it to be lucky if it gets to the guitar solo, you know. Yeah, and absolutely. Some of those guys, I mean, you, actually, I would say everybody there, with one or two exceptions, were just hitting it really, yeah. really hard. It was great. Yeah, it was so much fun. It was just full of those kind of players. It was awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> Lars. <laughs> yeah. But you're basically getting to hang out with them all, you <laughs> yeah, know what yeah, I mean, right. at, the same, at the same time. Yeah. So you just go from chatting to one to 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 you know it was. I always feel really like awesome. Lars gets a hard time, doesn't he, as a drummer? He's sort of like everyone is very quick to sort of jump on him and and criticize him and. Yeah, but, but no one else can do what Lars does. Yeah, you know? I still it's I like, think he's got like, and he also he's aware 
of yeah. the, his perceived shortcomings and stuff. And you know, yeah. and <clears throat> he's just a badass. You can't. He is a bad. Yeah, it. and he's, he's so an, he's funny. Just, such a funny guy. Yeah. yeah, such a cool, lovely guy. Mm. Loves giving it a big one. You know, he's always giving it the big one. Because when he, he finishes a song, he's like, "What's that? Yeah, what's yeah. that thing he does?" Have you seen the thing he does? Um, he does uh, during Metallica shows where someone will come and put put their foot up on on his bass drum and he'll he'll shoo them off and like come round with a rag and clean it. And <laughs> <laughs> he does all this. Brilliant! Stuff. He's got shtick. It's amazing. That's what he's got. You know, yeah. you need that. Gotta love Lars. One needs that. Yeah. You're very good at um, um, shtick stuff as well. There's a lot of drummers that hide behind the set. Whereas <laughs> if I'm, wherever I'm doing, you're part part of the. Uh... Yeah, you give me no choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you love it. No, no, it? I love it. <laughs> there was one you used to do. What was that? Uh, you, you used to hang, grab one of the drumsticks oh, yeah. and just, <laughs> just lean as far back as you could. Yeah. <laughs> People love that. It's sort of like those old it sort of It was our Titanic moment. Well, I always saw it as a sort of Harold Lloyd, you know, silent mm. movie kind of stuntman type yeah. vibes. You know, that's... that's Clearly like, you trust me, so... Yeah. 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 I think that's... Uh, it's so important to be able to rely on each other in those situations. <laughs> yeah. It is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about... Normally on these um, podcasts, I talk about the pitfalls of the music trade. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's things like, you know, adapting to, you know, adapting to life when you're not on the road, you know, where the come down after the shows, that kind of stuff. How how do you unwind um, after show? I mean, because because you are such a, you know. You, you're an exaggerated character on stage as well, so and you do a lot of funny stuff. Um, yeah. So you you're obliged to sort of be an exaggeration of yourself anyway, like in the same way that everybody who's in the touring arts has to do that. Um, so do you find that? Do you have any sort of, you know, like identity crisis, or do you kind of um, struggle to to go back to doing regular everyday? Rufus living at home in London type vibes or do you do you get the blues at the end of a tour what's how do you adapt um oh god this is gonna be a really cheesy answer but Can't wait. um I have to say <laughs> it's the truth uh since getting my dog it just makes me look forward to coming home ha ah, because you've got an, and just a little, taking him for a walk a little guy that needs you yeah, waiting for you. There's something about that. There's something about having a dog and having something else to yeah to think about. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's the best distraction ever. Yeah, because you can't just lay on the settee feeling sorry for yourself. No, you've got to go for a walk. And yeah, get, you have to. Yeah, you know, get some fresh air, and you've got to feed it. No matter how tired you are, or if you just get back from you know two months with no sleep or whatever. That's interesting because I think that's one of the things that um, James Hetfield was saying. Like he, he finds it difficult to adapt to taking his own bins out and sitting there with his two cats. Yeah. Whereas you're saying that the animal element of it is is actually the, the yeah. I think it helps. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe yeah. cats and dogs. I mean, that's, you don't have to take the cats for a walk, I suppose. No, they just hunt mice on their yeah, own. Yeah, and then you don't have to feed it either. Yeah, that's pretty handy actually. Yeah, it's self self sufficient, isn't it? Yeah, mm. my guy's not the biggest fan of cats. I think that that goes a long way back. Yeah, have that you, age old. Uh, have you ever thought about um, bringing your dog on tour? Uh, I've thought about it, yes, but uh, I think it gets quickly vetoed by your brother. <laughs> well, he's he always tried it's to. It's only because Bonnie. We've tried with Bonnie. We did. A, I loved it. I had no problem with it. Did a couple of tours with was, Bonnie, and then there was Bonnie's a same sort of size as your dog. Yeah, you know, she's a little Griffon. Um, I think it was mainly Softy um, taking her out for the walks and stuff. Yeah, which that's you know part of his remit. That is part of the yeah yeah, yeah exactly. guitar technician and dog walker. Yep. At the time, um, which I think he'd be quite. I mean, Softy loves a little walk around, a little stroll around. He loves picking up shit as well. He just. 
He loves it. I know. I know that's one of his favourite things to do at home. He'll just go around picking up other people's dog shits, you know, (laughs) as a hobby. And he's really. Do you have that when you go home? An identity thing. I think. um, Yeah, I think it's difficult. It's difficult to say because I'm always reluctant to go on tour, and then I'm reluctant to for it to end okay like i get so settled in whatever i'm doing yeah i adapt to it really quickly like as soon as i go on tour it's like oh yeah cool i can sleep i can do you know my there's yeah. routine in my day and i i'm totally used to it then i get home and it's like okay so this is my routine now i'm gonna do this and, and i and i very very quickly adapt you know so i don't i don't really suffer with any of it it's just like when i know that the next phase is coming that's when i start to go oh i've got to make the most of this because i don't know what the yeah, next bit's yeah. going to be like you know that's like, I always think about that because at the beginning of Darkness stuff, before the first record came out, we were all living in bed sits, um, struggling, you know, money-wise, just difficult times in London. You know, it's not, that's a really mm. expensive city to try and break through in the arts, you know. It's, uh, it's yeah. hard, you know. But those were just some of my favourite times. <laughs> I just like, yeah. So I, I'm really good at um, making the most out of whatever situation I mean, really. So I don't think it affects me in the same way, just because we spent so much time <laughs> struggling. You know, yeah, it yeah, makes yeah, you course. makes you more malleable and more adaptive. And I don't know, the longer you struggle, the more the more fun you, it is when you do it. I suppose is. Yeah, yeah. The more rewarding. I think so. It's always getting to the airport is uh, one of my favourite. One of my favorite. When we times see everybody, of the, of the tour, yeah. yeah, the first, the first day, if we're flying to the states or something, that's always the funniest because everyone's roles just fall in a line <laughs> immediately, you know. <laughs> the, and uh, yeah, it's the camaraderie thing. It's the best. Yeah, it's good because we don't uh, see enough of each other outside of touring, you know. We really don't. No, that's why Castle Darkness still needs to happen. Yes. Uh, so Castle Darkness yes. being when we pool all of our resources, sell all of our houses and just buy a big castle yeah. to live in. <laughs> and move in together. <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean... Who doesn't think that's a good idea? Use the comment section below to use tell us. Use the comments, yeah. <laughs> um, to, and if you see any castles on the market, then please... Uh, do let us know. Yeah, um, paste a link in the uh, comment section below. Um, what's your view on um, television programs where um, a panel of experts um, decide whether or not somebody's good enough at being a pop star to make them into a pop star? Um, <laughs> I do not watch them. Do you not watch them because you find it excruciating um, because you have so much empathy for the people and the contestants and you can't handle the, you know, the topsy-turvy? Uh, yeah, partly. Yeah. But um, it's, I don't know, I do find them quite painful to watch. They're just, I find they're like designed to numb your brain and it, that, that gets quite boring for me. Is that because of the genre of music that they tend to operate in or is it because it's Saturday Night TV? What's, um, what's your aversion? I like the bloopers more than anything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'll YouTube the bloopers oh, and watch okay. all the worst ones. Mm-hmm. I like those. There was a time when you and I became somewhat obsessed with a, a Take That performance that was on... Um, oh, yeah. I might remember that one, yeah. What was that on? Is uh, like, uh, you know, Pop Idol or... Um, England's Got Talent or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, they did, you, you're such a big star to me. You're everything I want to be. <laughs> I just want to be nice. <laughs> Isn't that the words? That's the one. And then there's yeah, a bit yeah. at the end where he goes, shine, shine. And, uh, <laughs> and then we were just really obsessing about it. And then it disappeared from the internet. Like they had it. It did. Like the expunged, next day. You know. Yeah. Or the next week or something, yeah, because we watched that quite a lot. I, I think we were responsible for most of the views on that video, yeah. um, and I think I think they took it down because they could feel that we were mocking them. 
I mean, I don't know how they did that, but it's amazing. They did. It is, I mean, it is a pretty spectacularly bad performance. It wasn't the best. No. I've seen. So that's why I like it, because I think, you know, I think in terms of the, whilst it's exploitative, those television programmes... Um, those moments will It's happen. hard, to, I mean, it's hard to sort of sympathise when you've had the struggle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you think you think it's easy to just come and do that and go on a competition and do it then by all means make a tit out of yourself then, oh yeah, then it, yeah, yeah you know yeah. that's but then but then it's there's some it's so cruel you know <laughs> it's so cruel it I, is I like they can be very like, cruel they can be ruthless <laughs> yeah but and I like laughing at the bad performances from established artists that are on there that's mm. okay because it's like laughing upwards you know laughing down is is just so if there was a way of just having the bad performances from established artists. I'd watch that. That would be a great show. All day long. Yeah, what all it, day. What would it be called? Um, Bad Idol. Bad Idol, yeah. Or, um... <laughs> <laughs> An evening with uh, Mark Owen and, and friends. Oh, okay, yeah. Be... <laughs> so, okay, so if we can make a Saturday night TV show with some of, some of the worst established artists on there, and yeah. you had to pick the lineup, you had to choose five established artists to do yeah. the worst Saturday night TV program of all time. Who would you put on there? Oh, okay, how many how many contestants have we got? Well, it's not a competition; it's big oh. musical numbers, but sung live. So, in your view, who would who would make the most? Who, I mean, because you want it to be things that you love to hate, you know, stuff that you can shout at the TV. Um, My TV's just started talking. Did it? Sorry. I thought somebody just walked in. Wait, hold on, I just tried to space by you. <laughs> you just put me on pause. Crikey. Hey, chill. There's no one there. What's he moaning about? I don't know. Pigeons. Uh, um, okay, who would they be? I mean, okay, we're really going for this. Sam Smith. Sam Smith has got a great voice, and I think he's really funny as well. I, they are, I think they're really funny. Okay. Shit. Okay. Not allowed, um, Sam Smith. Okay, not allowed, Sam. Fine. <laughs> Dan Hawkins. <laughs> yeah, as long as there's a key change involved, that's a good choice. Yeah. And then, I mean, I can't have that without uh, a young Frankie Poulain following up, just because I want to see the one after the other. Yeah. But just on the same show, you know what I mean? Do you remember um, when we sang, when we played Conquerors live? Um, I think it was in Sydney, maybe? Yeah, I do remember that. What, what's your recollection of it? I remember Frankie umming and ahhing in the dressing room about <clears throat> wearing a big cape, which Dan uh, convinced him. It took about 40 minutes, I think. Dan to convince him to wear this cape and that he looked awesome in it and he looked <laughs> like a really tall wizard mm. and a lot of wizards are tall though because one of the first spells they do is to make this one was yeah yeah with cowboy boots on mm -hmm. and it was um it was magical it was magical yeah yeah he vowed never to do that ever again. Which is a, the only people that suffer in that instance is us and the audience, really. I mean, I thought it was a mistake. Yeah. But yeah. 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 How important is it to have like um, a personal relationship uh, with your co? Like, because traditionally the rhythm section refers to the bass player and the drummer. Um, can you give me like top five bass players that you've worked with, including current? Oh, uh, Neil Fairclough. Oh yeah, 
so, he's awesome. So he's 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 Queen's bass player, isn't he? He is, but he can also just play everything. Um, he's one of those guys. So that was fun to just call out things and you know, and it was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So in what um, context was that? Was that when you were playing with Queen or was that um, some other stuff as well? Yeah, no, no, that, yeah, that was that. And but and I first played with him with um, Brian and Kerry Ellis years ago. Oh, right. So that was the first time I met him. And uh, he's hilarious as well, really funny guy. Yeah, um, I think I was talking to him after a show once and um, he did this thing where at the end of the conversation he just went like this and fist bumped me and then he said, street. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he did this thing as well. He goes, he used to go, actually, oh my God, I can do it. I can actually do it. I'm wearing a wife beater. Yes. He would, he would, he would be in the dressing room and he would, he would look me square in the eyes <laughs> and go, I know what you're thinking. Bruce Willis, die hard. <laughs> <laughs> It was the best thing in the world. So cool. Uh, he looks obviously exactly like Bruce Willis. He does actually, Hunt. yeah. A lot like him, yeah. But yeah. but with a beret on. But with a beret on, yes, exactly. <laughs> Bruce Willis, uh, yeah. Bruce no, Willis uh, in paint hard. That's what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, one of the coolest ever, though, was... Uh, I can't remember what the show was for now. I oh, know it was for the Teenage Cancer Trust and um, I got to rehearsals first or sound check or whatever but first and, and, I, and I was sound checking the drums for them and then about 10 minutes in I'm just playing the same thing I hear this slap bass in the background the best I've ever heard you know yeah. <laughs> and I look up and it's Mark fucking King wow. right in front of me what a guy! Uh, 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 yeah, we just had a we just had a five minute jam for a bit. And I love Mark King. So that was the most unforgettable one, for sure. Mark King but, from uh, Level Forty Two. My favorite of all time is Frankie. Yeah, Monsieur Frankie Poulain. Yeah, nothing brings me what Frankie brings me. True, because um, I think he's more than a bass player. Not to not to underestimate no, it's true. yeah because it, it's just like in terms of like just the silhouette for a start the silhouette is beautiful a good degree of pointing um and gesticulating yeah there's huge vibes going on you know and you never know what's going to happen yeah there's that too yeah uh, he does bring the thunder mm. monsieur poulain yeah it's a great combination, you and him. It's, uh, I always think that's that's a hell of a rhythm section. It really is. And the kids yeah, love, love it. it. The kids just love it. Um, and also, really strong backing vocals as well. Yeah, well, yeah. You can't deny it. No. I just hope they're really loud. Yeah, I usually, most of the time, I just have them, I have them loud in my ears because it's good to pitch to. Yeah, you like to turn those up. Don't yeah, you, yeah, I get them really loud because it just gets me going, you know. It's yeah. Like throaty. Oh, well, I've got two. I've got a big sub behind me and two wedges. Yeah. So I just get that cranked right up in both the wedges, so I get just that. Yeah. And no other. Well, because I think there's stuff on so stage. much harmonic information in what he's doing there, and and also rhythmic. So mm. it helps you and me really. Yeah. Well, sometimes he can hit two notes at the same time. Mm. I swear it's on purpose. Like Mongolian throat singing or something like that, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, it's amazing. It really is. Let's talk about um, Infant Rufus. Um, so when you... When did you first start... Infant Rufus. Yeah, Infant Rufus. What, what, um, how old were you when you first started learning drums? Um, well... I was put on a drum kit at about three, I think. That's the first time I don't remember a thing, but uh, apparently I was pretty good. Pretty good. I can imagine that. <laughs> uh, no, but 12 was when I started taking it seriously, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. 12 was when I started... Uh, I, I 
tinkered around on them and I came, kept coming back to them a little bit before that. But 12 is when I went, oh, okay, I need to get to this kind of level. Mm. And I need to do this every and day. And what was yeah. it that you heard that made you, inspired you to do that? Uh, it was Taylor Hawkins. It was. It was the first time I saw him live and uh, it was just mind-blowing. Yeah. I've never seen such a beautiful style but still really ferocious you know he was smashing the crap out of them and but making it look really fluent and uh you know loose it was, it was amazing and um yeah so that was the that was the first time I, I saw it and i just thought it was the coolest thing i'd ever seen wow that was it and he because he was your godfather he was, and yeah. um, so was he already your godfather at the time when you when you first saw him play, or did that happen? Was, he was my godfather that day. Aha, uh -huh, okay. He was, yeah, yeah. My dad whispered something in his ear, and then he uh, he just turned around and went, "Fuck yeah, I want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really cool. So uh, yeah, that was it. It's nice. And, uh, but yeah, but then I started practicing every day, mostly to. Early Foo Fighters stuff <laughs> at the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was the first? Because if you've been in bands before, like um, original bands, right? I mean, were you? Yeah. Could, did you have a band of people you were at school with, or something like that? Yeah. I had, uh, well, we started a band at school, me and two people, but uh, two friends. But um, it would it stayed in school. Oh. You know, we didn't venture out from it. Did they um, um, did they pursue music careers afterwards, or did they go and do something else? Yeah, they did. One of them did. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she did. Um, I don't know if I should say a name or not. Yeah, of course you should. Uh, Elliot Sumner, Coco. We we had a little band together when we were at school. Um, but. Um, Anyway, after after school, I, I started a few different bands, and just uh, just just getting to playing really more than anything else. And uh, yeah, they were all kind of different, all rock kind of based. And uh, what kind of venues were you of... playing back then? Sorry, what kind of venues were you playing? Um, pubs. We just played a couple of pubs. You know, nothing major. Yeah, mostly in Brighton. Uh, um, but yeah, and then. Pretty soon after that, I um, joined the uh, a musical. I uh -huh. started working for that. And so that yeah. was was that the the we will rock you. It was yeah. We will rock you. We will rock you. And when you play those songs from We Will Rock You, do you try and do it in your dad's style with the sort of hi hat that opens on the snare drum every time? That kind of stuff. Yeah, I tried to do that every single time. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that easy? Because it's completely, it seems contrary to the way you do things instinctively. It's not the Taylor Hawkins Yeah, I know approach. what you mean. Um, when I learn anything, I just put it on in the headphones and listen to it a thousand times until it's in there kind of yeah. thing. So I guess I just played it a lot. And what, you know. was, what was it like? So did your father have to come and sort of approve you? And, and uh, did you get a lot of stick for... I got loads of stick for it, but uh, no, he didn't actually. He um, he uh, he wasn't in the room at the time when when they chose me. Mm. I, I did an audition with a bunch of people, and uh, it was quite nerve wracking actually. But um, yeah, just went in there and just pl played the song as best I could. You know, just exactly how it was on the record, basically. And and only a few people really did that. You know, most people kind of tried to add their own fills and influence and stuff. And this guy, Mike Dixon, said, uh, uh, you, you know, these these few can stay and play another song kind of thing. And then we'll choose from there. Wow. Yeah. So you went in on a day when it was just all drummers? Yeah, there was about 30 of us or something. Yeah. I always think but, it's impressive yeah. when, when a musician says that they were in the pit for any sort of... West Endy stuff, you know, that's that's elite musicianship, right? Yeah, there. it was an amazing. You just what was that? I just it's a sticker. 
<laughs> it's a sticker. Where did that come from? I don't know, it just came out of my nose somehow. It's not what it looks no, like. No, it's uh, you're right though. It's um it's it's a lot of work, you know. They work a lot. It's it's great money, but it's um but it's yeah, you're you're working each show is like three hours, you know, normally. Yeah. With a short break in the middle. And depending on what show it is, you, you know, things like the Lion King are really, really busy. Mm. Um, I met some of those guys and yeah, they're incredible, incredible musicians, percussionists and Do they stuff have to maybe. dress up like lions when they do it? Yeah, they dress up like lions and um yeah, they hit the drums like that. They play like, like a sort of blue man group thing, but with lion outfits. But with lion outfits. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have to dress You've up? You've seen it? Uh, I haven't been. <laughs> this is going to startle yeah. you, but I haven't been. Um, I'd love to go. Uh, just not sure why I never got around to it. I just wasn't available. Um, but So did you have to dress up like your dad then? Um. <laughs> no. Did you have to dress up like Queen? No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I dressed up like uh no 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 we didn't, thank God. No, but it was it was um it was three three years I think I did. Wow. Three years. And I think two of those years was just non stop. Yeah. Matinees so, as well or matinees, yeah, like nine nine, sometimes ten shows a week. That's a hell of a lot of drumming. Um, were you were you worried that, that you'd your style would change? <clears throat> You know, having uh, been obliged. No, to... actually, I was just looking at it as really good work experience. Yeah, you know what I mean. Just putting in a shit ton of hours. Yeah, because that's another thing I noticed about you when you came in to the darkness um, touring cycles. Um, yeah. Because it isn't for everybody, you know. That's that, yeah. And and I noticed that when you you just came on and it was like, oh my god, this guy just loves touring. <laughs> it's like. Well, it, yeah. And you really sort of injected all of us with this sort of a, a renewed in, enthusiasm for it. And we hadn't had that, you know, for years. It's like we just hadn't had that kind of desire and, and level of, I don't know, I don't want to call it gratitude because that sounds like hippie nonsense. But, you know, you just seem, I know you're saying that. But you just seem to be like really, you embrace the lifestyle and throw yourself into it. That's That's one of the first things I observed about you. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy's going to be touring for his entire life <laughs> you know it's quite <laughs> obvious to me you know i hope so so that must have been yeah per perhaps that was to do with the um the formative musical experience you know yeah i mean it was the first great the first really great job i ever had you know and uh i couldn't believe that i was getting a steady paycheck you know it was unbelievable to me so and it was also the first time i was touring so by the end of those two years everything was gone <laughs> You know? Yeah. So it taught me a lot of le those lessons as well. Yeah. Uh, I'd come back and I'd be like, "Wow, you know, well done. You've you've earned all this money and you've done really well. And you know, what are you going to do with it? So, it's gone. <laughs> I've already spent it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a really great thing, and I'm still friends with all with all those musicians. And they they were awesome people. Yeah. And um, are they still doing musicals and stuff? Those guys. Are uh yeah 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 i think all of them yeah well most of them yeah. so then after you after you've done the um three years of uh we will rock you touring um did, you ended up playing with um uh jeff beck didn't you for a bit yeah i got to meet him at a charity show that um <clears throat> that my dad was doing and he uh so he wanted he was going to sing ten songs, and at the end of this mini festival, and so he wanted me to play drums for those, and and then we all found out, Mister Mister Beck was coming in to play because he wanted to, so he came into the rehearsals, and I remember all these all these old school pros, you know, musicians in the band, all started shitting themselves. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and like everyone was checking the windows, you know, to see if he was arriving. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was. He was really. He had that kind of weight to him, you know. Yeah. And he just walks in and and goes. Uh, and I'd never met him at this point. And he goes, um, "Yeah, yeah. How's it going? How's it going? I, I thought we'd play a couple of Jimi Hendrix songs as well." 
and at home, guys. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to figure those out right now, are we? Okay. Uh, which ones? And he goes, um, uh, we'll do Little Wing and uh, Manic Depression. Mm, cool. And, and then or the, this great bass player, Steve Stroud, he, he looks at me and goes, um, he's like, good, good luck, mate. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I, I just had one quick listen to it outside. I, I, I remembered the song, obviously, but I yeah. hadn't tried playing it. And, and uh, just nailed it first time with, with Jeff playing, and, and, uh, and that was it. He was, he was like, oh, you're, you're all right then, aren't you? Aren't you? you can handle yourself. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, he offered me a job after the show. That's really cool. Which was amazing. Wow. I never got to tour with him or anything. Oh. But, um, but we did a few charity shows and we did some studio stuff, which I'll always be forever grateful for. That was the most amazing experience ever. Wow, that's so good. I love yeah. Jeff. But I remember when um, you and I were on tour with the Hollywood Vampires, which is the, <laughs> yeah. um, that's the Alice Cooper, um, Joe Perry, yeah. um, Tommy Henriksen, um, Johnny Depp, uh, Chris Wiseman, and what's the, the drummer's name again? Glenn Sobel. Yeah. Um, Sobel actually sounds like a cymbal manufacturer, doesn't it? But it does. It's like a cross between Sabian and Sobel. Sobel. Glenn Sobel. <laughs> he should be a singer, actually. Glenn Sobel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were playing with them, and I think was it? It was Manchester, wasn't it? When when uh, Manchester. Jeff Beck turned up, and it was, like, yeah. and we watched. The same thing happened. Like everybody went to pieces just because he was there. You know, like the, yeah. the excitement of this all-time guitar legend walking in just really got, That's what got I found to everybody. All the years knowing that guy mm. is no matter who you are, you know what level of this game we're in. You are, you know, yeah. everyone just quakes when, when when they see him or yeah, or if they know he's going to be watching. And what yeah. is it about Jeff Beck that gives him that kind of power? Do you think? I think it was the fact that he was effortlessly cool all the time, you know, just effortlessly. Uh, he never played the same thing twice. You know, he, he it would, everything is an improvisation, and but always nails it, you know. Uh, I, I always thought it was partly because there hasn't been many guitar players that are that expressive as a lead player. Yeah. You know, and he... Those, Absolutely, those sort yeah. of techniques like gargle and stuff, you hear them overused and you hear them used sort of to make your ears prick up and go, what the fuck was that? But he uses it in just like a really, everything he does is so subtle, isn't it? or it did so, rather, is so subtle. Absolutely, I think that's the word, yeah. <clears throat> there's, there's so much to be said for space, isn't there? You yeah, know? it's just a nuance um, and expression in what he did. And also like when he was doing the fast stuff, it was unbelievably impressive. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. He could he had it all in his repertoire. Yeah. He could pull them all the tricks out of the bag, but he only did it when they were needed, you know. And they didn't and they, it was a true maestro. Yeah, and they weren't they weren't tricks in those instances. There's, there's a lot of sort yeah. of like lead guitar players they they often sort of um have like phrases and and licks and stuff that they use to, to try and impress everybody so they can tread water and wonder what their next step's going to be in an in improvised solo. But with him it was always just like Exactly the right thing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly the, right the right moment. Time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just so brilliant. And because we saw him play at the, uh, the, what's that festival called again? The win Wintershaw. Winter you, yeah. Yeah. Winter yeah. Winterstool. Yeah. Wintershaw. Um, yeah. And he was mind blowing. It was just mind blowing. It was really fantastic, you know. And he made it look so easy. Yeah. You know. You can hear whale songs from it. <laughs> it's yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's really emotive and sort of, I don't know, just conjured up all these brilliant images if you just allowed yourself to drift off and listen to Jeff Beck playing live, like, which you could do in, the, in, the, in an event like Winter Store. You could just lay on the ground and let it, yeah. let it wash over you. It was, it was fucking mesmerising. It was really good. Get lost in it. Yeah, it was so good. No, he was a, the truest musician ever as well. You know, he... He was always li listening to new stuff and, uh, you know, if it was a guitar player. Um, but, uh, you know, he gave a couple of homeless people jobs just because he liked their drumming, you know, um, on buckets and stuff. He's, he's, he was just the, 
if he if he recognised something he liked, he was all over it and he would support it as much as he could. And you know, really cool, really cool guy. Yeah, it was sad when he passed away. That was a, yeah, very was sad. A sad moment as well. Yeah. Um, but that but that time Manchester. Oh yeah. Was awesome because he showed up, uh, watched our set, loved it, and then there was a little interlude. Uh, between us and Hollywood Vampires, and he was with us saying hi and everything. He had a couple of drinks with us, didn't he? Yeah, came into our dress, dressing, dressing room, didn't he? Because because he knows you, obviously. That's that was. Yeah, well, that was awesome. And then uh, uh, the funny thing was, like, at the end. Well, really, uh, yeah, that was that was hilarious. But <laughs> the thing about him sort of coming into the dressing room with us was kind of like there was there's always a disconnect between the the when we're a support band and then there's the main attraction which was the Hollywood Vampires like we don't we don't try and bother them you know if we can avoid it we, we just keep ourselves to ourselves and if we're invited to go and see them then we'll go and do that but we, we, yeah, we try course, and sort of yeah. maintain a respectful distance to the, to the main attraction and on that occasion he was in our dressing room so everybody was in our dressing room you know yeah. and suddenly the Darkness's yeah. dressing room was the place to be and all these legends were in there well you know fawning <laughs> over Jeff Beck really and, uh, yeah, in the smaller room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. It was so great, you know. And he's, you know, he was just a. He was the life and soul of the party, wasn't he? And, and then, yeah. And then, so we watched, we watched the vampires with him, didn't we? And then, yeah. uh, as and then as they were getting into their bus, or as no, as they were in their bus. Yeah, and they were pulling out of the sort of compound at Manchester yeah. Arena. Jeff Beck pulled down his trousers didn't he and his pants and i think he spanked his ass he just in in that general direction he just mooned them as they went past <laughs> and it was a 70 year old man mooning the hollywood vampires it was just yeah astounding one of the most badass moments it really I've was I was, I was so impressed and <laughs> and I, I was sort of watching that moment and i was just because you can't see into the tour bus and i was just imagining yeah. like um perhaps i don't know joe perry and some of the other guys in the band just looking out at their hero and just seeing his ass and then just being like this <laughs> so, see you later, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> oh, look, it's Jeff saying goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you really just, oh, bless him. Yeah, it was an amazing moment, really. Just so rock and roll. It was great. Really rock and roll and a wicked sense of humour. He was an awesome, awesome guy all round. Wow. Um, what other legends? And he came to one of our shows, didn't he? Yeah, he came to... G-Live. That's right, yeah, the Guildford show, yeah. wasn't it? I remember, because I walked to... Uh, we, I, was, I, was, I went out to go get him and make sure he, he, there was no, you know, he wasn't waiting or anything. And, and, um, and he'd already got in and he was already in the lift coming up. And <laughs> So I was looking for him and I was like, shit, okay, I'll go back up, see if he's in. And uh, go in and, and then... Uh, I don't think he saw you guys yet, you or Dan. And then as we as we walked out, I was like, right, FYI, uh, Jeff's on. Jeff Beck's going to be standing on stage, right? <laughs> <laughs> you both just looked at each other, shit yourself, and then walked out. There. <laughs> it was uh, amazing. And we were like, ah, oh, <laughs> yay! <laughs> and then just being... Dan's like, what my side? <laughs> but yeah, your side. That's fine because yeah. then I, I can just do all the tricks and hit all the bum notes and, and just. <laughs> All the clam notes, and he, he can't hear my and guitar. Go, Dan anyway. Hawkins on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Yeah, but what a, an imposing presence, really, because it's just you know, his everything about him was iconic, wasn't it? His, his haircut, yeah, know, it really the way was, he spoke, yeah. and everything is just just brilliant. Um, so what else should we talk about? What hmm. songwriting? Songwriting, yeah. That's a good topic. Yeah. Um, what what comes first? The, the, the words? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> don't you start. <laughs> What's the shittest question you can ask? Well, about? generally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay, songwriting. Okay, let me, let me ask you this well, question. Um, I, I was going to ask you how you... What was the first song that you wrote? Oh, um... God, what was it called? Um, and how old were you? I think I was probably about 
uh, I reckon I was probably. And like, did you write from the whole? Did you write the whole thing? Yes. Did you finish it? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I did. Yeah. Um, I think it was called My Little Beatrice. Um, because it was just when uh, uh, beloved Prince Andrew <laughs> had had a child called Beatrice. And I thought, yeah. that's a really nice name. And I was thinking about all the things you could rhyme with that, you know. Um, yeah. I was really influenced by, um, I loved the songwriting of Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac and ABBA when I was a kid. And oh, so, yeah. like, I was trying to hit oh, yeah, something that was, yeah, I was trying to hit something that was between ABBA and Fleetwood Mac and fell way short, but finished the song. I, well done. I finished yeah. the song, you know. I, Lyrics has always been really important to me, and I used to have a ball clip on the wall, and I'd listen to the records that I was enjoying and try and decipher the lyrics myself and put them up there, and I'd ah. never get it right. Oh, that's good. You know, I'd never get it right. So, but the but some of the things that I thought I'd heard and hadn't, I've ended up using. You know, because it's sort of right. Like, okay. Because the things that I what I think I'm hearing is always like a bit more clever than what it really is. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I want to yeah. say that it's not always the right thing, but it's, it's always like um, a more cerebral bit of prose than, than what, I, what it actually is, you know? Yeah. So I've ended up using stuff like that for Darkness songs and other songs, you know, just, just for the exercise of mishearing stuff. It could be a great, great way to, you know, find, find starting points. You're, you're, writing a song, you're writing songs at the moment, aren't you? Trying to, yeah. But I'm um, super self-critical at the same time. Ah, that's interesting. Do you think that's reducing your output? Cause you're, Definitely, yeah. yeah. I go through stages of thinking everything's rubbish. <laughs> and then, do you do that? Do you ever have yeah. that? Yeah. Um, if I had a tip for you yeah. about that. I mean, I, I've experienced that myself earlier on in my writing sort of career. Yeah. And I think one thing that occurred to me was like, if something seems like it's a bit rubbish, really lean into it. Make it as rubbish. Oh, okay. Make it as rubbish as it can be. And there'll be stuff in there. There'll be stuff in there that, that that's still usable. You know, you, usable. Can, you pull it yeah, back yeah. from that. But you shouldn't let like the, the the sneaking suspicion that what you're doing is rubbish stop you from finishing the the job you know because that's that really okay. is the hardest point like because i think so any any sort of musical or creative endeavor is really daunting at the beginning of the thing so if you kind of go oh shit now i've got to write a song i got to write all these words there's going to be this many verses and it's all got to make sense and it's all got to rhyme um so you start doing it and because of the parameters you've set yourself that's what makes it rubbish yeah you know if you had if you didn't have to rhyme anything, you just had to write something that was true, that'd be the easiest thing in the world. But you've got to make it bounce and sound like a, yeah. a song. And that's where the rubbish starts, I think, isn't it? You just sort of go, yeah. oh, fuck, this is cheesy, and it has to be cheesy, otherwise I can't get to this point, which rhymes at that point, or sounds like it rhymes or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, those are the things that yeah, trip you up. I think I need to stop listening to Bob Dylan whilst I do it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, know, I don't know, because... Um, <laughs> Bob Dylan, like there, is, there are some Bob Dylan songs, about 12 verses, right? Four or five of them are absolute killer. Yeah. But there's always one that's treading water. Yeah. I mean, even the most staunch Dylan enthusiast will have to admit that, I think. Yeah. And there's some stuff that doesn't always make sense, but it's in the context of this thing, it sounds like it should. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it okay. makes you want to sort of lean in and... and get as much from the song as possible and those things are there for a reason to make the really special moments count you know yeah that's, yeah i get you that's why they're left in so i think if you feel like something's rubbish don't let it stop you just write a rubbish song yeah just get it over the line get it over the line and then come back to it and chip away at it you know it's, it's you're sculpting really aren't you yeah <clears throat> no it's um but it's a weird one i mean i've learned a lot since being in this band my god but um, but when I when I, when I joined, we had a we had a different way of doing things, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> we were uh, we went straight in with a rehearsal room, I think, and and we just basically wrote an album in two weeks or something. Yeah. So that was Pinewood Smile, wasn't it? And um, yeah. And I think um, the reason why we did that was because Dan wasn't producing it. You know, normally you'd have like a bit more of the sort of time luxury in the studio to develop ideas and stuff, but we needed to 
be able to record uh, in a in a residential studio that we were paying for, so we didn't have much time to do it, like three weeks or something. Yeah, yeah. And we had to we had to have everything written and recorded in that time. Yeah. And I think that's actually brilliant because it was. If you have any sort of self doubt that that makes makes your well, I think especially bringing on a new mem- member as well. It was a it was a good time for that to happen. Like, yeah, you know, I think uh, thrown in the deep end and and uh, be creative at the same time. You know, it was it was good. Yeah, and there's some great stuff on that record. You know, yeah, Buccaneers of Hispaniola. Um, yeah, I love that song. Solid gold on that song. Solid gold is on, on that record. album. So it's not. It's on that song. It's Japanese is on that. Song of course it well. is. Yeah, that song's got Japanese on it. <laughs> you know, that yeah. song's got all of those brilliant hits. Yeah. And then we changed it up a bit, but we kind of kept that way of um, doing things for for a couple of albums, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think what was the what was the album after Pinewood Smile? Was that was that Easter is cancelled? Yeah. Yeah. So that was more of a production number. That was more production based, yeah. But the actual recording, mm. um, or the, at least the backing track, some of yeah. the backing tracks, like they were. <laughs> we always have to come up with the idea and then track it straight away. Yeah. You know, no like letting it breathe and oh shit, maybe I should use this yeah. fill or. Oh, yeah, that's know, the thing that I've noticed about first one. like w- w- that way of doing things is like um, when you have a record that's done like that, you don't tend to listen to it anymore because it evolves in the live sphere, and the things yeah. you do, you, know, you find smoother ways and more groovy ways to to play yeah. everything. You know, it's always the groove, isn't it? It's the groove is that is what changes, I think. Yeah, for sure. In a subtle way. Not just of the drums, like of everything, really. Yeah. No, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. And then, and then you end up with a live album that sounds better than the recording. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's the right way around, yeah. though, I think. What do you do when you hit a wall, lyrically? <laughs> you don't really hit walls, though, do you? Um... The only time that happens... We can, we can present you an idea and you can have the lyrics done in 25 minutes. Yeah, once I get going, it's pretty quick. But I think the... Um, the, f- the tr- I don't know, the difficult part is if That's you... That's what I want to learn out of it. Yeah, okay. Well, um, so what, what happens with you when you hit the wall? What's, 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 the, what's the stumbling point? Um, I guess it's just doubt. Doubt of... Every idea, every following idea. Right. Basically, I come up with, I'll get, I'll get in the swing of things, and I'll write a bunch, you know, like a couple of verses or something, or maybe the the end of the second verse I'm struggling with, and and it's not tying in with the rest of it quite as well, or it's maybe a bit of a cheap rhyme, and I don't know. That's, but I'll just keep questioning it for for ages, and then I'll have to give up on it and. And I'll end up coming back to it in a month and I'll be in a completely different headspace. And yeah. <laughs> you know I, mean? I don't know. I just keep... It's difficult to finish a song, I've found. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could always do that thing. You could always try and do that thing. Where, so, the David Bowie thing? Well, no. I, mean, I was going to say, like, do a thing where you write a verse. You write a chorus. Then you repeat the first verse. And then, oh, okay. and then you know, yeah, then get, you get a first chorus and a bridge, and then you repeat the first one, and then it might sit better as a second verse. And sometimes that's the thing that fucks you up because you sort of think, yeah, you know, the narrative arc has started here, and you've left yourself nowhere to go by the end of that verse because you've basically said everything you want to say in one verse. That's what's stopping you. So you put that as the second verse, and then you've got to come up with the first one. Yeah, so you yeah, could try yeah. shuffling it like that, that and then and then sort of then you get to a different point in the story or the prologue or whatever, you know. There's yeah. there's other ways to a million ways to skin the cat. But I think um it, it depends well, what kind of song you're writing as well. Like if you're writing a song that's f- like thematically really really specific about 
you know, say for example, an illness. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Then it's then it's a lot more straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. But also, but, um, you know, if you if you're doing like um, another thing to think about is lists. People love lists, right? Not just I'm not talking about Schindler's List or out like that. But if you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, different stuff. That's how we did Friday night. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a list. Um, you get people to go one, two, three, four, one. You know what I mean? Or A, yeah, B, yeah. C, D. Li list of stuff. People love lists. People love a list. They do love it. So if you get okay. if you get stuck, do a list. <laughs> <laughs> that is my piece apples, of pears, oranges. The uh, market song. Cabbage. <laughs> Fresh fruit and veg, the new single from Rufus Tiger Tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I'll try lists. Do a list. You know? Yeah. Because if you could, like, um, if you're sort of like saying, oh, I want to describe um, someone who I adore. And what can I do here? I can't, how many ways can you say I do? Um, I, I cherish our time together. I adore looking at your eyes. I. I find you, <laughs> I find you very attractive, um, and well, you know. And then what's so just a list of platitudes? Uh, oh, um, you are my favourite person. You could say that. Um, yeah, that's a good one. You know, and then you can rhyme person with Merson. Um, yeah. You're my favourite person, um, but you drink like the former Arsenal footballer Paul Merson. Mm, good one. Uh, and then you've got some darkness in there as well, you know, which is always good, you know. Yeah, always. Yeah. Okay. What do you think the difference in songwriting is between on your own and with a band? Wow, that's a good question. Because um, <laughs> I guess you've only got one idea, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's only it's one the, it's, idea with one person. Stuff that's collaborative is is always... Both more, more vision, I guess. Yeah, a singular vision is probably easier to realise, but it's not as much fun to do as, as with a group. Yeah. But it's also like, um, like just, I don't know, I think lyrics is difficult because it should be quite singular in its thing, you know. But I like, you know, if I'm writing a lyric, I, I like to sort of see if, see if people are liking what I'm doing and then you sort of bounce ideas off and then you get feedback and then it becomes collaborative. Yeah. But when you're doing it on your own, it's... A, it's I don't know, you can just go push and do it. <laughs> Are you subtly saying I shouldn't laugh at some things you suggest? No, I'm, f I'm saying that if you laugh at the things <laughs> I suggest, I'm going to do them more often. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both know that anyway. <laughs> I should really try. <laughs> That's really... Um, I was disappointed, but like when we did um, uh, Motorheart, that was the COVID one. You yeah. Know, and... Um, so it was an album that we did remotely, really. No, I, I kept making demos and I, I was trying to get you guys to like them. And I really thought you were going to like this one that had like, um, <laughs> had like a, a line that I'd got from you. It was, um, oh, no. how's a man supposed to go to work if he can't even do up his flies? Come on, yeah. baby, won't you kindly tell your tits to stop staring at my eyes? And I was, I was really pleased that I'd got that in there. <laughs> and I thought, Rufus is going to love this. And then, and then, uh, but then it was like, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, sh should we use it on the album? No. <laughs> well, I said no. Well, I just nobody said anything. I was like, oh, oh, shit. oh okay. So it, it didn't happen. But I managed to, in the second verse, I got an even better one. It's like, uh, I got, what was it? Um... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I can't remember it now it's, it's, it's like a <laughs> you'll, lo you'll love this one um, it went um, had a bad day but I've got something that's guaranteed to make you smile turn around girl I think you'll agree that it's nice like that once in a while <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is, and I was only doing all that it's stuff. Gold dust. It's just amazing, isn't it? I was like, I was like, Rupert's is going to love this, but it didn't make it onto the record. I was so disappointed, and, and you know. But the glorious thing about it is, like that—that that is how we do stuff. Is like stuff. If we make each other laugh, then it's then it stays in for better or worse. Yeah. Most of the time, it's for worse because it makes yeah. you know people don't take what we're doing seriously. And we don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the problem, you know. 
But I think there's bravery in that. Maybe. I'd love it if, like... Um... Or do you think it's stupidity? Oh, God, it's such a fine line. But I think it's, um, it's definitely stupidity. Yeah. You know, because... Uh, but what I'd love to happen is, like, when we're doing stuff on the next record, we're already coming up with really funny stuff. Hmm. Um, but there's a way of doing the funny stuff where it still, it still matters in an emotional way, you know? 100%. You're a master at that. I, th- I mean, if we, when, it's, when we get it right, it's right. And, it's, yeah. you know, we don't always do that. But I feel like the stuff we're writing for the next record is like that. You know, yeah. it, it's moving, but it's really daft yeah. at the same time, you know? It seem, yeah. seems really stupid, but it's kind of... Hopefully it's, there's something in there that, that matters, you know? Probably not. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> well, we're going to do like 200 song ideas at the moment before we yeah. uh, start tracking. That's actually what I wanted to say to you about um, the way we've been writing songs lately is because um, a lot of people ask about where's, how do you get into the zone for writing? Do you just sit down with a bit of paper until it's done? And, and that thing that you mentioned about we can finish a song in about 25 minutes now, that's actually because we've found the zone. And I think... yeah. I think we know where that is now. It's in between just having fun. <laughs> you know, like mm. we're just yeah, really it is, yeah. really loving each other's company, just having great times. Yeah. And then not forcing it. Yeah, and it just happens <clears throat> like when you least expect it and just to be ready for that and emotionally prepared for yeah. for the undertaking, you know. We might only spend an hour a day in between kayaking and playing tennis or whatever it is we do yeah. and then we just get, yeah. a so- get a song or two out and then and, yeah. and then but it is usually unanimous when when we when, when that idea comes out you know yeah it's uh, yeah yeah we found the zone that's a good way of putting it's it it's really special it's really special to have that thing. that's why I'm so I've... I'm so in, I'm really enjoying the darkness at the moment because it it took us I think it took us a few records to get into that vibe, you know. And COVID really didn't help. It was to, it was, to not be able to be in no. the same room was very, very difficult. Yeah. You know, it's not the same. Yeah, that was weird. That motor heart. That's why we had to do this album. Yeah. We all had to be in the room. You know? Yeah. We're, we're, not doing, we're not doing any writing separate. We're all mm. doing it all together on, or nothing kind of thing. It's good. I keep trying to, I'm going to keep trying to shoehorn that. That like those two lines in. <laughs> See what happens. This time I'll be like, yeah. write it down quick. <laughs> oh. Happy days. Quick fire round. Here we go. Top five drummers. Uh, John Ponham, Taylor Hawkins, yeah. Mitch Mitchell, Lucy Goosey, Ian Pace. And me old man. Oh, brilliant. I'm glad he's in there. Um, least favourite band in the world? Oh, Current band. Good question. Least. But it has to be a band. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What if they all sing? <clears throat> That's not a band. You can st- not what I call a band. Is this... <laughs> Are you gonna are you gonna start slagging up a barbershop quartet or something? No. <laughs> uh, if that... uh, okay, Maroon Five. They're my least favorite band. Okay. Um, yeah. What's your favorite car? Ooh. Oh shit! This is a quick fire round. I'm not very quick, am I? Dream car. Next album sells all the all of the copies. What do you What do you buy? Oh my god. Um, uh, it's either the old Aston, the James Bond special. DB5? Yeah, or the, um, or this, that's, that Ferrari that Steve McQueen had. I think it was a... A Dino? 69 or something, 1969 something, oh my God. I'm not sure. I can't remember the bloody name. Anyway. One of those. Okay. Well, I'll put you down for Aston Martin. Um, mm. Yeah, DB5, James Bond. Okay. Your, your house is burning down. You've rescued the dog. Um, you're allowed to grab one other thing before you escape. What, what would you take? Porn! Oh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> the, the, the porn box. 
Yeah, because I, I still use magazines. Yeah, of course sure you do. Yeah, That's you're what, a drummer. It's <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. No, I would grab. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not how to say laptop or phone. <laughs> oh, they'll be in my pocket <laughs> I've got a backpack already with the laptop and I just carry it around the house uh, my guitar or my picture of my granddad oh there. that's the one my we'll go for the granddad picture, picture. Of my granddad. that's lovely during the war yeah um, okay um, what position do you play um, if you could walk into any soccer team what, what, what position would you play Probably a right winger. That's what I was going to say. I've 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 fed off off your days. service many times. <laughs> Feasted on your crosses. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you had to lose one limb, which one would you get rid of? Um, if like, there was a really evil person saying you got to chop off one of your arms or legs, which one are you going to get rid of? Cool. It's got to be the left leg. Yeah. So then would I, like, if I, when it gets to a chorus, would I have, like, a pulley system and then I'd have to open the hi-hat a little bit from front of the stage? And then, yeah, no. I'd, just, I'd just give you the nod. Did you go, did you go? What now? Did you go, did you go? You're like, too late! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we can figure that out. Um, peaked cap or beanie? Ooh. Depends on the weather. No, no. Okay, now I've got to tell you what weather is. It's changeable. <laughs> and you've got to choose <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. Uh, peaked. You can, have a, with the can have a peaked beanie, I suppose. You didn't think of that, did you? No, but you, you just changed the rules. Oh, yeah, you I did actually. Sorry, no, you can't, you can't have one of those. You're right. Um, <laughs> pizza topping. <laughs> Tomato. I'm going to say this once. Tomato. All right. All right. I got that. Tomato. I've it down. Cheese. Oh, I love cheese. And maybe a mushroom or two. Oh, for protein. Nice. Um, but please, Lord, no pineapple. Oh, that's my next question. Dashed. <laughs> um. Okay. So, s somebody carves. Somebody carves you out of wood, right? Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> and then leaves the chisel on the side and says, I'm just going to the toilet for a minute. What do you think? It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, don't, don't touch anything. And then goes off. If you could change one thing about the, <laughs> the wood carving of yourself and you have the chisel and the skill and the inclination to do it and a, a small window of opportunity, what would you change? Well, obviously... Two massive wooden balls. <laughs> so you'd actually glue some more wood to it. You wouldn't chisel anything off. No, I'd, I'd chisel away from the leg. <laughs> so you'd have really thin legs and then much bigger balls. Really thin little stick legs. So you'd have like the but normal balls and then also like some additional much bigger balls that are eating into the legs. I would, I mean, I can work a chisel. I can work those things into the leg. Okay, here's the second part of that question. Then yeah. it magically manifests itself on your actual body. Happy or sad? <laughs> uh, they've banned the conkers now, haven't they? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, and also, like, your underpants aren't going to fit those balls in, plus um, your, legs, your legs are now really, really thin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose... I suppose the stick legs make me a bit sad. Yeah, I'm going to go with sad. Sad. I'll put you down for sad. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, These are great questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know why we didn't just start with this. <laughs> thing. Um, okay, so... You wake up in a world where um, there's no such thing as... Um, uh, I mean, this, I mean, this is not obvious. Hang on a second. Um, okay, so um, you wake up in a world where um, you, 
<laughs> you're only allowed to be in a three piece band it has to be power trio which one of the darkness do you get rid of <laughs> Because there's a new mandate. You can only have three musicians. Cause, and the Musicians Union have stepped in. They've said it's not fair having all right. these people on stage. It's got to be power trios. Oh, those guys have stepped in. Yeah. Okay. At last. Like, you, bands have got too many members, basically, and then it's just not fair. Yeah. So they need to cut off yeah. a member. And you, yeah, you've got to get rid of a member. And actually, you don't have to completely get rid of them. They, they can be your tech. <laughs> or they can, <laughs> you know, do the costumes or whatever, you know. Okay. Right. Dan Hawkins, you're out of there. Dan's out. Okay. And because then... he can play drums, so he can give me the night off. Oh, that's brilliant. Right? Okay. Yeah. It's pretty brilliant. And um, It's pretty brilliant. <laughs> and he can sing. It's really brilliant. He can sing so he can give me a night off as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I probably wouldn't let that happen though. <laughs> no. no. Um, but, uh, ne yeah. neither with the and fans, neither with the fans. They would love it. They would. <laughs> um, oh, God, sorry, Dan. You had to pick one. I put, you, I put you in a difficult position. Um, and now I get to watch him watching me behind you. Jesus. Just his, his sad eyes boring into you. Yeah, doing this. <laughs> oh, yeah, he would be doing that as well. <laughs> if you could invent. A fabric. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you've, okay. You've gone to, I've got it. Gone actually. to a textiles factory, and they've said to you, like, carte blanche. We'll make anything yeah. you want. Like, we've got, we've got the engin engineering prowess of. I already know what it is. All right, what, what kind of fabric is it? It's a jelly suit. Okay. So it's a jelly fabric. So it's jelly. <laughs> That can zip. Zip up jelly. Zip up jelly. What's the advantage of that? It's sort of translucent. And it's just jelly, but hangs in the same shape. It doesn't fall about. It doesn't oh, yeah. break apart. So like this, fall about. Does it the shape of your body, or does it improve the shape of your body? I think... Maybe the... No, jelly suit should sit like a suit. Should hang like a suit. So not too... Not, you know, super tight fitting. But... Yeah, that's what I do. Strong jelly. Um, imagine, um, like, uh, the government's, the world government realizes that um, if we carry on eating meat and, and, you know, being wasteful in that way, meat and dairy and everything, everyone's obliged um, to go on a vegan diet. What's your go to uh, vegan recipe? Uh, vegan burgers. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, when, okay. <coughs> <coughs> Was that a good answer? Yeah, it's a really good one, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you are in a submarine, um, yeah. it goes way, way, way down into parts of the ocean that you've never seen before. Um, I'm there. And then you find, like, a, you discover a new species of fish, right? Um, yeah. And... Goes like it looks like this, right? Oh wait! So it's got like um. It doesn't matter what it looks like. So, and then when you you capture the fish, and take it up to the top, and then like the um, the science folk there, the, the marine biologists, um, they say, "Oh, amazing! What are you going to call it?" Roofish. Brilliant. Sounds just like my name. <laughs> it does actually, yeah. It sort of looks like it as well. That's actually would be a good band name for your side project. Roofish. Mm. Mm. That's pretty good. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, not including Roofish, what would you call your side project if you weren't just allowed to call it the Rufus Tiger Taylor project? Whoa. Um Um, 
Ramrod. It's pretty good. Wow. I think no, I'm sticking with the R's. I think there might already be a band called Ram, Ramrod. I'm just going to look on Spotify. Oh, no. Real quick. Ramrod, the artist. Here we go. They have six monthly listeners. Oh, wow. Okay, they're big. Their biggest song is called Bad Shit. <laughs> <laughs> just listening. Oh, um, sorry, it's cancelling out. It's a little bit like um, the riff is kind of not dissimilar to the one on that Pearl Jam song. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's that. That concludes the interrogation. I think. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, happy days. That's really long. Thanks for all of your uh, being so gracious with your time. I'm really looking forward to going on the tour with you. Um, well done on everything, and I know it's been a roller coaster of emotions in the last couple of years. I'm really happy that you're still in the darkness and, and you didn't abandon us. So am I. <laughs> so, yeah, this has been the Rufus Tiger Taylor interrogation. Did you have fun? I did. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure and never a chore. Justin Hawkins rides again. Again. I'll do it. Nice one. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm just going to stop recording. Thank you for watching. Um, let me know in the comments what you thought of it and if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, perhaps I can address those in a comments episode later on. Um, if you want to see Rufus perform, you can do so at The Darkness Show this year, at a The Darkness Show this year. Um, we're on tour in the UK, Europe and the USA, and there's a link to it, uh, or there's a link in the description with all of the dates and uh, tickets and so on. Join me next Monday for another episode of Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Lots of love to you guys. Um, see you on the ice. Nice one. Okay.